भारत का पूर्वी राज्य उड़ीसा ऐतिहासिक और पर्यटन की दृष्टि से भी बेहद महत्वपूर्ण है अगर यहां सूर्य मंदिर है तो गोपालपुर जैसा समुद्र तट भी चिलिका लेक भी जो खारे पानी की एशिया की सबसे बड़ी झील है लेकिन यहां के मंदिर इतिहास का एक ऐसा झरोखा है जो अतीत के वैभव को भली भांति परिलक्षित करता है यहां बहुत से ऐसे मंदिर हैं जो अपनी वास्तुकला से आपको सम्मोहित कर लेंगे ऐसा ही एक मंदिर है 11वीं सदी का लिंगराज मंदिर इसमें जिस देवता की मूर्ति प्रतिष्ठित है उसका नाम है स्वयं भूलिंग ये आधा शिव है और आधा पार्वती इससे भी पुराना एक मंदिर है यहां जिसे परशुरामेश्वर मंदिर कहते हैं ये 650 ईसवी का है ये भुवनेश्वर का सबसे पुराना शिव मंदिर है इस मंदिर की बारीक नक्काशी देखते ही बनती है इन मंदिरों में तो आज भी पूजा की जाती है लेकिन यहां एक मंदिर ऐसा भी है जिसमें अब पूजा नहीं की जाती यह है ग्यारहवीं सदी का राजा रानी मंदिर इसके चारों ओर ये बहुत ही सुंदर बाग है ये मंदिर ब्रह्मा जी को समर्पित है और यदि यहां पूजा अर्चना होती रहती तो ये भारत का दूसरा ऐसा स्थान होता जहां ब्रह्मा जी का मंदिर मौजूद है फिलहाल केवल पुष्कर में ही ब्रह्मा जी Welcome, uh, dear friend, once again in the live interactive teleconference of Postgraduate Diploma in Clinical Cardiology program. This is our second session, and in these sessions, we will continue from our previous uh, discussion that is mainly we had uh, in between discussion of the management of ST elevation uh, MI. By the meantime, one of our students has asked questions that uh, during if, um, if a patient is having like acutely developed BSD, 
then uh, or uh, like rupture of uh, septum. septum. Can we uh, thrombolyze this uh, type of patient uh, at that time? So this is what one of our questions from Bangalore is asking. Yeah, I did not go into the details of those conditions, but if you encounter any of the mechanical complications of acute myocardial infarction in terms of a ventricular septal rupture or a free wall rupture or mitral regurgitation, the preferred modality of the treatment is that you have to go for a early surgical correction of these conditions and uh, uh, during the same time you will go for what is called a surgical reperfusion therapy. If you are going to repair a ventricular septal rupture, you are going to do a simultaneous coronary artery bypass surgery. Unfortunately, the risk of surgery itself is very high, but if you don't treat these patients, uh, the risk of mortality is very high. Untreated patients have got almost 90% mortality and those who are treated, they have also got almost 50% mortality. But the uh, only effective treatment in these patients is you have to treat surgically and then you have to do a simultaneous CABG in those patients. Yeah, I think uh, the, our student uh, has uh, got his uh, answer. So uh, we'll uh, start uh, this discussion mainly from the uh, last uh, topic. And in this... Uh, sessions we will mainly discuss on this uh, non-ST elevation MI and uh, be, because there are some common uh, topic uh, within that uh, management part. So yeah, Chennai please. Hello? Chennai sir. Yeah. Hello. Yes, please. Yeah. Sir, we are calling from Ch Yes. Chennai. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the role of uh, GP2B3A inhibitors in lately presenting MI sir? where we cannot uh, thrombolyze the patients. Yeah. The, uh, the question is, sir, uh, that rule of the GP2B3A, if a patient is present lately, not uh, acutely, so what could be the rule of that medicine? See, GP2B3A uh, inhibitors are primarily used in periprocedural patients, but uh, uh, there are certain new indications for GP2B3A inhibitors, and a uh, few newer limited studies have shown that if your patient is high risk, you did not thrombolize them, but uh, you did an invasive procedure later on, you found that your patient is having a proximal uh, LAD lesion, or your patient is high risk having a cardiogenic shock or some other things. In those patients, uh, you can use these agents, but uh, whatever benefit you can get is when you treat them early. Once there has been infarction, the conventional therapy, you have to continue. Yeah, I think uh, his question has been answered. We can start other discussions. Now we are just uh, going to discuss in brief about the secondary prevention and long-term management as it's going to be similar in acute coronary uh, syndrome uh, including ST elevation MI, unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI. Uh, your patient before discharge, it is very important that you continue with the medical therapy uh, for hospitalization and before discharge, if you think your patient is not having any contraindication to exercise test, your patient should be subjected to a low level exercise test uh, around uh, 5 metabolic equivalents. And uh, if you find that your patient fits into high risk category on the test, your patient should be evaluated with a coronary angiography. If your patient is in the low uh, risk group, uh, he can go for a, a conservative yeah. strategy. Bangalore, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, ask a question. Yeah, please ask your questions. Uh, sir, what is the ratio to give uh, 325 mg of dose of aspirin and 160 to 300 mg of dose of clopidogrel? Can't we give usual dose as, as uh, over there? Uh, what, why are they giving this much of dose? Yeah, the dose is different. Uh, you are talking about the higher doses in the acute coronary syndrome. See, if you go through the pathophysiology of acute coronary syndrome, and there have been studies, they have uh, analyzed uh, that thrombus, and it is primarily composed of platelets. So platelet aggregation is one of the major components which is leading to the occlusion of the arteries. You would like to inhibit maximum number of platelets uh, with a maximum dose of aspirin which is safely tolerated. And the effects have been seen uh, uh, up to the doses of 325 milligram of aspirin. Uh, that is what we give in the form of uncoated tablet and it has to be chaved so that it gets absorbed early and it bypasses the uh, enterohepatic circulation. Yeah. 
this is the prime logic behind uh, high doses of antiplatelets. You want to inhibit platelets early. Normal dose, the whatever routine dose we are giving, it doesn't solve the problem. That is the reason. It solves the problem, but it's efficacy. You know, yeah. uh, uh, in all the clinical trials, you, you see the incremental dose and the effect. And then you have to see the safety also. So yeah. these are the maximum tolerated dose with the best benefits. Yes. Chennai, please. Hello. Uh, ST elevation, uh, elevation MI. Yeah. After thromboiosis. After the refractory chest pain is there, even with uh, clopilot, anticoagulant and uh, maximum 10 million of uh, morphine, what could be the next strategy to main, uh, control, relieve the pain, sir? Uh, you want to say after morphine also that if the pain is sustaining, that what could be the, what could be yes, the next step of management? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, pain management, as we have discussed earlier, starts from the nitrates in the forms of oral nitrate, repeated two to three doses. Then you have to see the tolerability of nitrates also. Then you go for intravenous nitrates uh, uh, till your patient uh, starts developing uh, features of hypotension. Then you add IV beta blockers in those patients, uh, five milligram dose repeated every five minutes, assessing any adverse effects and uh, uh, any contraindication to that. If they are contraindicated or not, if they are not effective, you can go for non-hydropyridine calcium channel blockers. After that, if pain is not relieved, you can give the morphine in uh, doses initially in the t uh, form of 1 to 2 milligram and gradually you increase. And uh, simultaneously, you are going for a reperfusion therapy in your patients. So uh, when you are uh, going for a, a reperfusion therapy, you know that if you have done a successful thrombolysis, your patient's pain will be relieved. And if despite the full treatment and thrombolysis, your patient's pain is not relieved, you should think that this patient may require a rescue PCI. That is another thing, means your thrombolysis was not successful, your patient is having ongoing pain. But to support that, that patient is having ongoing ischemia, you should also have evidence in the terms of raised biomarkers. Yeah. And these are the patients who are benefited by a facilitated PCI. You should refer them for early invasive procedure and if required, you should go for a PCI in those patients. Yes, I think his question is answered. So now we were talking about uh, uh, early risk stratification. It could be in the terms of a low-level exercise test, which could be simple TMT or a stress radionucleotide ventriculography, stress echocardiography, or stress radionucleotide myocardial perfusion scan. And if results of this test fit into the high-risk category, your patient uh, should be uh, treated uh, with a revascularization strategy. Uh, your patient should be subjected first for a coronary angiography and if you found that the coronary anatomy is uh, uh, suitable for PCI, you go for PCI. If it is suitable for a CABG, you go for uh, CABG. And if the coronary anatomy does not uh, indicate any severe stenosis, you can go for a conservative medical therapy. Now there are certain points, specific points for secondary prevention. These are the secondary prevention of whole coronary syndrome. Uh, first is your patient should be instructed to stop smoking, absolutely. Your patient should continue aspirin 150 milligram once a day, lifelong, until unless it is contraindicated or your patient does not tolerate this dose, then you can go with a 75 milligram aspirin. Your patient should be given clopidogrel 75 milligram once a day. The duration of clopidogrel depends on whether you have thrombolyzed your patient, you have done a, a primary uh, coronary intervention in your patient or whether a drug eluting stent or a bare metal stent was used in this patients. Then you have to continue beta blockers with a target dose of 200 milligram sustained release. Uh, uh, but the whatever dose patient tolerates, you have to continue. If they are contraindicated, the heart rate control should be done in the terms uh, in, uh, by the non hydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Your patient should be started with AC inhibitors. Their effect is uh, uh, most prominent in patients with the LV dysfunction or history of heart failure. But all the patients who have uh, recovered from acute coronary syndrome should be given AC inhibitors. If patient does not tolerate them, you have to go for angiotensin receptor blockers. And if patient has got features of low ejection fraction aldosterone receptor blockers like uh, 
epilirinone or spironolactone has to be used. But you have to look for hyperkalemia and other contraindications for these agents. Now statins. You have to give high dose statin at initial presentation despite the value of cholesterol. And then later on you should target the LDL uh, at around 100 milligram per deciliter and consider it to further reduce up to 70 milligram per deciliter. Your patient should be instructed for a physical activity. Primarily, immediate post-discharge, it is determined by the result of a low-level exercise test. Later yeah. on, he should be instructed to achieve a target of 30 minutes walking 7 days a week or at least 5 days a week. Patient should be uh, uh, treated for strict control of diabetes with a target HbA1c level of 7%. Hypertension has to be controlled as per other guidelines and specifically in the patients who are having renal impairment or who are having diabetes mellitus. Now we come to the second part which is unstable angina or non-ST non elevation myocardial infarction. Now uh, uh, definition of non-ST elevation myocardial infarction is that your patient is having a new onset angina or worsening angina uh, which is usually lasting for more than 20 minutes if not interrupted by sublingual or IV nitrates. And it is described as a frank pain. And this uh, uh, unstable angina uh, or non-ST elevation MI can be further classified as non-ST elevation MI fulfills the criteria of serum biocardiac markers uh, level is increased more than three times more uh, of the upper limit of normal. If a patient is not having enzyme rise or having an enzyme rise less than above level, uh, he is termed as having a unstable angina. Now the causes of unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI as the question came earlier. Usually uh, it's a, uh, due to thrombus of a collateral vessel or a subtotal occlusion or thrombus or a distal microvascular embolism. There could be other uh, non-atherosclerotic causes of the unstable angina which could be a distal embolism from a thrombus or there could be a progressive mechanical obstruction to the coronary artery, there could be a coronary vasculitis inflammation, there could be a secondary unstable angina. Now you have to stratify these patients like in ST elevation MI, you have got ST elevation, you have to treat them with a reperfusion therapy. But in unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI, uh, you have to risk a stratify which depends on the multiple factors. Now your patient, if he has got any of the following features, he is considered to be in the high risk group. A patient is having advanced age, is having diabetes, is having a post-infarction angina, is having a peripheral vascular disease, prior cerebrovascular disease, or he fits into brown wall class 2 to 3 or brown wall uh, class B or having a secondary angina, a patient is having multiple episodes of pain and on the ECG if you are having more than 0 0.05 millivolt ST depression or T wave inversion uh, more than uh, 3 mm or a, a bundle branch block which is not the old uh, new bundle branch block, your patient is having uh, increased cardiac biomarkers your patient is having increased C-reactive protein levels, elevated creatinine, elevated glucose or if you have gone for an angiogram it shows a thrombus, multivessel disease, ILV dysfunction. These points fit your patient into diagnosis of high risk unstable angina or NSTMI. Now management of the patients with unstable angina non-ST elevation MI. As we have talked earlier the management is similar to ST segment elevation myocardial infarction except in terms of fibrinolysis and primary PCI. Now initial diagnostic evaluation of unstable angina as we have discussed about the risk factors in terms of biomarkers and the history. So we have to take a thorough history about the symptoms, associated risk factors and any contraindication suggested by the history. Physical examination should be done to look for other associated conditions and hemodynamic changes or clinical signs of acute coronary syndrome. Now in ECG we may see the ST segment depression or T wave inversion. Markers of myocardial injury 
like we have to send a cardiac troponin, CPK, CKMB and myoglobin and their level will decide whether the patient is having unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI. And uh, echocardiography will add to the diagnosis which may show you the wall motion abnormality and varying degree of mitral regurgitation. Now uh, here I am uh, just showing you the ECG uh, uh, typically seen in unstable angina. Your patient has got a classical chest pain and your patient is having ECG changes with a significant T wave inversion in the anterior leads with ST depression. This ECG could be due to unstable angina or could be due to non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. The level of cardiac biomarkers will differentiate in both the conditions. Immediate management is similar. You have to strict go. For, uh, you have to advise the patient strict bed rest. Admit him into acute coronary unit. Then you have to put him on intranasal oxygen. Same loading dose of aspirin and clopidogrel has to be given. Pain relief will comprise of a subluxual nitrate or IV nitrate if not contraindicated. Statin high dose 40 to 80 milligram of atorva statin or equivalent dose of other statin. Now beta blockers if they are not contraindicated you can give to your patient. As we have discussed earlier beta blockers can be given uh, have to be given in ST elevation MI also. We have to look for certain contraindications of beta blockers in all the conditions. If patient is having sign of heart failure evidence of a low output status increased risk of cardiogenic shock or other contraindication to beta blocker medicines, they have to be avoided. Now anti-ischemic therapy also includes AC inhibitors and they should be administered orally within first 24 hours of acute coronary syndrome, whether it be ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or unstable angina. And uh, angiotensin receptor blockers are preserved for the patients who do not tolerate AC inhibitors. Now, first and foremost important thing in uh, management includes that a diagnostic workup. We have discussed about a lot of things in diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. A diagnostic workup should not delay the treatment and treatment should be promptly started once a primary diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome has been made. Like you have made a diagnosis of ST segment elevation MI, you have to go for thrombolysis early, as early as possible, if it is not contraindicated. If you have diagnosed a case of uh, unstable angina or non-ST segment elevation MI, you have to go for immediately loading dose of aspirin and clopidogrel and statin. And the results of other things will be coming later on, except those tests which are absolutely diagnostic for these conditions. Now, if at presentation your patient with non-ST segment elevation MI is uh, having high risk group based on the history, based on the physical examination, based on the ECG or cardiac enzymes, they have to be considered for early invasive strategy which will include a coronary angiography and whatever uh, 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 reperfusion therapy or revascularization therapy is indicated by coronary anatomy, they should be considered for them. If your patient is going for, now uh, GP2B3 inhibitors people have been uh, asking uh, previously in this uh, uh, statement, yeah. they are <coughs> usually preserved in the patients where you are expecting that a PCI is going to be performed. So you want a more aggressive antiplatelet agent like GB2B3 inhibitors, but they have to be used with caution because they are associated with uh, more bleeding complications. Now, uh, this is very important and differentiating point in the treatment of acute coronary syndrome that these patients should not be considered for intravenous fibrinolytic uh, therapy uh, exception to this is a new or presumably new left bundle branch block which will be treated as an acute ST elevation myocardial infarction. Yeah. And there, uh, yeah there, there was one question from Ranchi that student is asking why do we get arrhythmias and reperfusion injury after thrombolysis? That's a good question. Uh, as uh, occlusion in the coronary artery causes uh, acute ischemia, it leads to uh, a myocardial uh, alteration in the myocytes metabolism and myocardial necrosis. Those myocytes uh, which are already necrosed will not show any change with the reperfusion therapy. 
but severely hypoxic or hypoperfuse myocytes when are they are exposed again to the uh, oxygen and other nutrients they are irritable and they their behavior is little bit changed from a normal myocytes so these reperfusion injuries they lead to these reperfusion arrhythmias yeah. okay i think uh, that uh, question has been answered uh, here is a, a sample checklist for the patients uh, uh, and uh, can be utilized uh, for both the patients ST elevation MI and uh, non ST elevation MI just to show that we don't miss anything we should go uh, uh, for a brief history medication which will include aspirin clopidogrel low molecular weight or infraction heparin other anticoagulants GP2B3 inhibitors beta blockers nitrates AC inhibitors if any intervention done like cath or revascularization a risk factor modification in terms of cholesterol and you have to treat other risk factors also like smoking now late hospital care of patients same a non-invasive stress testing is recommended in the patients uh, who are at immediate risk because in high-risk patients you have considered for uh, invasive strategy for immediate or uh, 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 low risk group you have to go for a stress testing provided that your patient has been symptom free there have been no EC, new ECG changes there have been no rise in the serum biocardiac markers so you know that your patient is stable for more than 24 hours you can consider them for a, a stress test and on the stress test uh, if you find that your patient uh, is on the high risk group whether it could be TMT stress echo or nuclear imaging those high risk group again they are considered for invasive testing and revascularization if indicated by a coronary anatomy now discharge and post hospital discharge care is similar to ST segment elevation myocardial infarction yeah. you should I am again and again uh, talking about these medications because these are the medications which have shown a uh, long-term benefit and a uh, secondary prevention in terms of mortality benefit aspirin has to be continued clopidogrel is particularly important if aspirin is contraindicated or a patient has been performed with PCI beta blockers have to be given if there is no contraindication AC inhibitors are the preferred agent if they are not tolerated ARB should be given statins have to be continued anti-anginal therapy has to be continued if it was indicated during the hospitalization and uh, a patient had angina at that time control of hypertension and diabetes smoking cessation and regular exercise sir can I ask one thing yeah. the main thing is suppose you are having all set up there is a, you told that in case of non ST elevation uh, like uh, angioplasty is the main uh, ST elevation MI. ST elevation. ST elevation MI. Yeah. Coronary angioplasty is the main uh, part of treatment. Or thrombolysis is the main part of treatment in the case of uh, ST elevation. Is it? it? Uh, no. Uh, immediate reperfusion therapy the is most important part of management of ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Because if you are not going to open the artery within the time, yeah. whether it could be a no, thrombolytic. The question is different, sir. If you have set up and everything, can we directly, means, uh, uh, means uh, angioplasty uh, can, can we done all this patient instead of their ST elevation or non ST elevation in this case what could be the outcome the, do you have any this kind of study definitely there are studies that's why we have categorized always the patients ST segment elevation MI if you do angioplasty within 60 minutes that is okay. the preferred therapy that is the best therapy and uh, uh, the effects are similar but uh, it has got uh, marginally better and uh, uh, what we call uh, Patency rate. Okay. 90 minute patency rate is almost more than 90 percent in cases of angioplasty. You are directly opening artery. Yeah. And uh, if you do a primary angioplasty in all cases of non ST elevation MI or unstable angina, you know that you are uh, dealing with a thrombus filled artery and an irritable myocardium. So doing a procedure in acute coronary syndrome is not as simple as a planned coronary angioplasty. Okay. So whenever we consider primary, it has to be done by expert. And if we do uh, uh, this is strategy, invasive strategy, it has to be preserved for high risk group. We are near subtotal occlusions and their risk is almost similar to STEMI. It is not for an intermediate and low risk group because the procedure done in those groups has caused increased mortality. There is uh, one question. 
that student is asking within how many hours in case of cardiogenic shock in failed thrombolyzed we will go for PCI form from that is from the Kolkata. Uh, treatment modalities primarily depend on the availability in your setup. If your setup where you are having a, a, a patient who has been thrombolyzed somewhere else or he has come into cardiogenic shock to you, you are having a, a, a well equipped cath lab you will consider that patient for an early invasive intervention and you will go for an early uh, uh, coronary uh, intervention and a PCI in that patient. And uh, sir, one more question uh, from a student is uh, asking, what other opiate we can use besides morphine you know, for the man, pain management? Morphine uh, 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 inhibits all the uh, opioid receptors, so we can go for a preferred agent like uh, buprenorphine we can use in that case okay. with a dose of 0.4 to 0.6 milligrams and it is safely tolerated with the patient. Yeah. And uh, in this case, uh, we also want to request all of you while giving morphine, we have to just remember the side effect of the morphine because one of the major side effects is respiratory dis uh, depression. That so we have to. Uh, so whatever have to therapy you are going to give, you have to see for the contraindication at that time and you have to look for the adverse effects. Adverse also. Effect. That's why you are admitting these patients. They are high risk patients having a uh, adverse outcome if not treated properly. So everything has to be monitored closely and initially you have to evaluate your patient every uh, 15 minutes then every one hourly and then you think that your patient is stable then every four hourly it has to be evaluated in terms of clinical things in terms of serial ECG monitorings. Now there are certain conclusions uh, um, uh, we could reach uh, about the management of acute coronary syndrome that we have to have a high index of suspicion and diagnosing acute coronary syndrome. If you are having a diabetic, hypertensive, smoker or an elderly uh, or an individual uh, who fits into the age of coronary artery disease and is having symptoms suggestive of acute coronary syndrome or even if they are having atypical symptoms, at least we should consider a differential diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. Now early treatment is most crucial in the cases of acute coronary syndrome. Uh, studies have shown yes that yes please what is your question uh, we have a question we, we have two questions one one is uh, why we should not thrombolyze a case with non stemi and okay. and stemi second question and second is um, so what is the duration of uh, I mean, uh, prescription of clopidogrel when drug eluting stents are instituted. Some say six to one year, six months to one year, but uh, in the real time scenario, we give it for lifelong. Okay. Is it uh, your only two questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the first question was why we should not uh, thrombolize uh, this directly to non ST elevation. When you are giving thrombolysis, you know that these agents are plasmodium activators. They are associated with very high risk of bleeding. So you have to always tighter the risk and the benefit of a particular therapy. And in all clinical trials, they have given uh, the thrombolysis to ST segment elevation MI within time. The, uh, there have been uh, incidences of increased bleeding, but the risk and benefit of bleeding is less in uh, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. But uh, in non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and unstable angina, if you thrombolyze, the benefits have not been seen and they can be associated with increased bleeding risk. Yeah. So you have to tighter risk and benefit. And the second question is duration of clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is particularly important in patients who have been put a drug eluting stent. Uh, first of all, there is a dispute between a drug eluting stent versus a bare metal stent in primary angioplasty. Yeah. Uh, regarding that, uh, the Duration. also we are having questions. Yeah. There is one student is asking why uh, there is versus between drug coated stent and uh, without drug coated stent. Uh, what is the advantage and disadvantage? If time permit, this is what you are asking. Definitely, I think we have finished it. Uh, and, 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 uh, we are having one more slide before yeah. that. So we can answer all the questions. First of all, I will go for a duration of clopidogrel. Usual practice is that if you have put a bare metal stent, you should at least go for six months with a aspirin and clopidogrel. Aspirin in the dose of 150 milligram per day, clopidogrel in the dose of 75 milligram per day, daily dose. 
if we have put a drug eluting stent in those patients, the chances of intermediate and late strength thrombosis are very high. So we go for a dual antiplatelet therapy with a aspirin 150 milligram a day, 75 milligram day clopidogrel for one year at least. And after one year, uh, there is no as such standard recommendation for continuation of dual antiplatelet therapy. There are certain risks and benefits and there are certain new articles and papers. But standard recommendation says at least for one year you have to go for a dual antiplatelet therapy. You were having some question regarding yeah. uh, drug eluting stent and bare metal stent yeah. and primary yeah. angioplasty. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, most of the recommendations are from uh, American College of Cardiology and uh, American Heart Association. So till date there has been no standard recommendation for use of drug eluting stents in primary angioplasty. Drug eluting stents have got a marginal benefit of uh, 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 delayed target vessel revascularization what we call because they are associated with late uh, restenosis later on. But there is certain other theory that you are treating with the artery which is having a thrombus inside or there is an ulcer inside the artery. So if you put a drug coated stent, it may delay the healing. And if you put a bare metal stent, it will not delay the healing. Your ulcer will be completely healed over a period of time and uh, the chances are less. So it's all, uh, the standard recommendation is that you should go for a bare metal stent in a primary angioplasty. Uh, but there is no as such contraindication for drug eluting stent. So it all depends on the, uh, how much is the plaque burden and how much is the thrombus burden. So, uh, the whole lot is a yeah. interventional <laughs> cardiology issue. Yeah. There is one more question, sir. She is, uh, that question is whether it is justified to give first dose of low molecular uh, weight heparin or it should not be given? Uh, we always uh, uh, prefer to uh, go for a thrombolysis in a patient. Yeah. And if there is no thrombin specific inhibitor, like uh, uh, streptokinase is not thrombin specific. Yeah. So if you are going for streptokinase, we know that it is going to prolong APTT. So in that setting, we do not go for a straight dose of heparin, low molecular weight or a unfraction. We go for thrombolysis and then we repeatedly check every six hours what is the APTT. If APTT comes to one and a half times of normal, then we start with the uh, heparin therapy. It could be in the form of uh, infection heparin, low molecular weight heparin. If you are not treating your patient, your patient is presenting late, if you are not treating your patient with thrombolysis or PCI due to any reason, you have to start at the presentation, yeah. low molecular weight heparin. Now uh, I would just conclude uh, the topic here that uh, as we have talked about the high index of suspicion and early treatment which is most crucial. Uh, there are certain facts that uh, with the first medical contact, either an emergency team reaches to the patient or patient comes to the emergency department. Loading dose of aspirin, clopidogrel and high dose of statin, uh, they have to be given. And uh, trials have shown that they save more life than the reperfusion therapy after 6 hours. So the importance uh, is uh, that these medicines are uh, as important as an early thrombolysis. And then timely delivered, preferably within golden hour. The reperfusion therapy, it could be a thrombolysis, it could be a primary PCI. They are the mainstay of the treatment of ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. A pre-discharge risk stratification and the long-term secondary preventions are the key factors for preventing the uh, recurrent events and acute coronary syndrome. So I think uh, we conclude these sessions. And all of uh, our uh, students are having uh, lots of questions and uh, they are benefited by these discussions. There are a few more questions regarding the study material that uh, actually uh, study material uh, you have to report to uh, your uh, regional director because this time uh, onward we are uh, taking this decision that uh, uh, study material has to be provided by the regional centers. Uh, if somewhere regional center is not able to provide you the material, all these material are also available in the IGYAN course. That is, you have to go by IGNU website, www.igno.sc.in, then IGYAN course is there. In that IGYAN course, you have to just simple register, just like you are registering Yahoo or some kind of Rediff mail, and uh, you can download all the study material, and you can also see all this 
uh, video programs made by this uh, school because there are especially uh, echocardiography will be the very difficult for a new a new student so you can see all these video programs and numbers of time and you can really uh, uh, get benefit of these things pattern of term and examination question paper will be definitely informed you very shortly through the letter uh, we will write a letter to all of your uh, program in charge and you will be getting uh, answers out of that and uh, there are some more questions that students are asking I am just reading their SMS one is uh, because of the weak signal okay we cannot see these things uh, from Bangalore so uh, what you want to know this pattern of achha. the pattern of tournament examination I, I am uh, telling you again and again that we will definitely inform to your program in charge very shortly and the second question is uh, Patient presenting with MI goes into arrest, received with CPR, how to manage that uh, primary PCTA? That question is actually not getting... Better. No, I could get the question what he is asking about is uh, we have gone for the contraindications okay. for thrombolytic therapy. So prolonged CPR, what we call, is a CPR which is more than 10 minutes conventionally. Okay. Or if you are having a traumatic CPR, like usually in CPR, we do not uh, uh, give over more emphasis on preserving the ribs. Yeah. So ribs are fractured most of the time and there is a closed chest trauma. In those patients, a thrombolytic therapy is absolutely contraindicated. Uh, in those patients, you have to see the risk of bleeding. If yeah. you think that the large myocardium is at zero parity, you have to go for a, a you, you cannot delay uh, the uh, uh, treatment. So you can go for an early invasive approach. And if you see that you can safely revascularize with a PCI, you can go for PCI. But if you think there is a large trauma, intrathoracic, yeah. And uh, definitely with a PCI also you will be using high doses of GP2B3 inhibitors and, uh, and uh, uh, other agents to prevent the strength thrombosis. So in that case risk and benefit has to be seen. But thrombolysis definitely it is not the option in that case. Primary PCI has to be considered in those cases. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we will conclude the sessions over here. The discussion, do you have any questions? If you have any questions. Uh, standard recommendation is for once a day clopidogrel for one year if you are putting bare metal stand even for drug coated stand but most of the people in the practice use a clopidogrel 75 milligram twice a day rather than once a day that is not a standard recommendation most of the people say that the pure form of the clopidogrel you need only once a day some people doubt about the bioavailability but the recommendation is 75 milligram once a day aspirin 150 milligram there is a lot of uh, uh, interpersonal uh, different opinion about the dose of clopidogrel after drug eluting stand particularly standard recommendation is 75 milligram once a day for one year at least okay. any other questions uh, then I think uh, we will conclude the sessions over here and normally I would like to say uh, that uh, we are having teleconference uh, once in a month that is uh, end of the uh, Saturday and Satur uh, last Saturday of the month we are having teleconference of PGDCC and uh, <coughs> uh, all of you are requested to interact uh, through uh, the phone or by other way or you can ask questions also that is uh, the email ID is pgdcc at the rate of igno.se.in. So uh, you can uh, also ask the questions later on also if you have any kind of difficulties. Uh, so uh, here we will conclude the sessions but before uh, concluding the sessions I would like to say thanks to all our uh, students sitting here in uh, studio as well as uh, across the country and we are also uh, giving thanks to our regional director office who are really helping to our student to see this program. Uh, thank you to Dr. Mitinja, uh, Mitinder. Thank uh, you for giving and, the opportunity. Uh, we are also giving uh, thanks to our EMPC team who is really uh, working. Yeah, Bhopal, please, is there any questions? Yes, sir, after, we are trying for this long. After how much time of thrombolysis, heparin or low molecular weight heparin to be started to the patient? Uh, 
I think you could have, uh, or you would have joined the session later on. As we have discussed, we have to decide whether we have uh, used a thrombin specific agent or non thrombin specific agent. And we have to get APTT level as soon as possible and after 6 hours. So when the APTT level comes to one and a half times of normal, and we, uh, that is the time we have to start <coughs> with a uh, unfraction heparin or a low molecular weight heparin. Yeah. By the meantime, we get one more question. That is, can we use pethidine or phenargan for pain relief if morphine is not available? I think we can uh, use at least if morphine is not available for relieving pain. We can use, but we have to avoid the agents I have told earlier because many a times people uh, give a steroid. Like in, in like all the emergencies, people use steroids. So I have given an emphasis that the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, yeah. agents and steroids should not be given. Uh, a morphine or a equivalent opiate analgesics can be given depending on the availability and the tolerability of the patients. So I think uh, today's discussion is very uh, worthwhile discussion because uh, all of us we participate uh, here and all of us we learn from each other. So uh, saying thank you to our EMPC team and all students and our regional center. Definitely uh, without Dr. Singh uh, the things cannot be possible. And so before concluding I would like to say happy Diwali to all of you. Uh, so uh, here we will uh, end the sessions. Thank you very much to all of you.